la pogu, ni la pogu, a la pogu. Anyhow, Bob, you made it, according to my records. Number one tonight. You're here first. 1,000 pine points to you. Um, before we get started on uh, the best version of Christianity, I got some um, unboxing to do. Apparently, um, one of my fans thought it would be a good idea to give my um, email address to, um, to all these different Christian organizations around the world. And so now I'm getting a lot of Christian mail, but, which is great because it gives, me, um, <laughs> it gives me a good chuckle. So here's the first one from Danielle Colenda. And I got here, you're never going to guess. So this is from a Christian organization. This is for uh, Mini um, Matador. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a prayer cloth, I believe. There's absolutely no limit to what God can do through simple point of contact. All you have to do is act in obedience leading in your heart. This is cool. Um, maybe I should try it here, see if it works. What's with the beard? Uh, t Tom, you told me to wear, uh, have a beard, wasn't it you? Uh, when you act in faith, when you act, your faith begins to work. When your faith begins to work, God begins to move. When God begins to move, get ready for miracles that are special, extraordinary. Believing with you, your special miracles, evangelist Daniel Colenda. P.S. We believe that we share a special faith connection with you, and we take it seriously. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to minister to you in this way. Uh, okay, so I am holding an anointed prayer cloth we promised to send you. Well, yeah. <laughs> Please know that you're using this cloth as a sincere scriptural way to bring personal touch of miracle, anointing of faith to your need. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel, for the prayer cloth. It's, um, it's nice and red. Okay, what else did I get? This is from uh, Christ for All Nations, the ministry of Reinhard bon Bonicki and Dan. Oh, this is Daniel again, but with another guy. Never been opened. Oh, is it, now they're asking for money. Yes, please send me a free DVD copy of the message. This is that. Yeah. No presents, just while asking for money. Okay. Ooh, this one feels feels like a diamond ring in this one. It's like Christmas. This one I have to use as scissors. What did I get? Ooh, it's a box. <laughs> I better make sure this is not dangerous first. What, what is this? My goodness, they sent me a lot of words. St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco, the wonder worker? Oh my goodness. It's a story about a wonder worker. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are sending you holy oil from the from St. John Wonder Worker of Shanghai, San Francisco. Oh, I got wonder oil? <laughs> holy oil. This is scriptural, by the way. Now, I, please help me understand how this is not all superstitious, Christians. This, you're telling me this is not superstitious? That if you hold this, this has been a blessed prayer cloth, that's not superstitious? Oh, look at this. Holy oil from the reliquary of St. John. I'm going to see if it has an odor. <laughs> see, I'm a chemist. Like uh, This is how you smell things. You just don't stick your nose in there. I did that once with uh, concentrated sodium hydroxide. Oh. Um, yeah, it doesn't smell like anything. I wonder if I can use this to for my eggs tomorrow morning to make sure the eggs don't stick to the pan. <laughs> okay, so those are my three presents. I got holy water and a cloth. You see, and some Christians are saying, yeah, this is, this is crazy. This is nuts. It's a cloth and, ho and holy oil. But I, you guys pray, right? 
Um, you guys asked for a hedge of protect protection before you'd go on trips and, and travel in your vehicles. How is that any less su superstitious than, than a cloth? You're just doing it without the cloth. I guess you really maybe just need something tangible in order to make it superstitious. I don't know. Okay, uh, I want to introduce Pete Enns because I've been on record as saying if I ever become a Christian, Pete Enns would be the type of um, Christianity I would go to. And he is a PhD, Harvard University alum. He's a professor of biblical studies at Eastern University. He has taught undergraduate, seminary, doctoral courses at numerous other schools, including Princeton Theological Seminar, Seminary, Harvard Divinity School, and Temple University, and speaks and writes regularly to a diverse audiences about the intersection of the ancient setting of the Bible and contemporary Christian faith. So the bottom line is he's no dummy. He's educated. Um, he's the host of popular podcast, The Bible for Normal People, which is what we're about to listen to. Blogs at PeteEnds.com. He has written and edited and contributed to over 20 books, and including The Sin of Certainty. Mm, the Bible tells me so, and most recently, how the Bible actually works. Um, my, my biggest question for these guys is, like, it's Pete and his buddy, uh, Jared. Uh, what's his last name? I forget. My biggest question for these guys is, why are you still Christians? Um, because they're going to say some things and you're going to kind of go, whoa, uh, why are they still believing any of this? So let's, um, let's get you got three it. seconds. So smart. I'm going to play it at 1.5 X. And, um, I think it's still understandable and it's audio only. Another question though is, well, how do you know, you know, if you don't have a Bible that's inerrant or infallible, et cetera, how can you know? God is loving. I think those are two very mm. interesting and overlapping kinds of questions. So Jared, answer them. You've got three seconds. So smart. You're yeah. so... So the question is, how do you know God is good? That was the first question. They're fielding questions from guests. How do they know that God is good? So I am. You just pulled I, that apart. My mom always So, said. I mean, let me just see if I can re-summarize, re-summarize, if I can just <laughs> summarize for the first time what it is you're saying that really this question, and I think it's important, the reason I'm doing this is, is not just semantics, but it's different to say, how can we come to this conclusion? How can we think these things? That's very different than saying, um, how, are, how can we know mm -hmm. in some sense that it, that's more of a certainty question, right? How can we know for sure? That's very different than saying how can we come to the conclusion that and I think it's important because I think for a lot of us We conflate those two things as those are the same thing, right? Right. So, uh, do you notice how I just flipped that on you? So now how, what's the answer to that? Well, I mean a couple things mentioned here is you draw the conclusion from the crucifixion story and things like that and I Remember the question is how do we know God is good? And Pete ends up saying, you draw your conclusions from the cruci crucifixion story. Now, just listen to the words. How do we know God's good? Because somebody had to die. <laughs> oh. I have to say, I don't, it's not like I go to verses and think about God as good. I, I, I think about it very differently that, you know, if God exists in this infinite universe, I don't think God is bad. I don't, like, you know, I just don't. How do you know God is good? Because if he exists, I just don't think he's bad. See how that makes any sense. If God exists, I think almost by definition, God has to be good. Now, whatever good means. That almost by definition. Well, for guys like Jonathan McClatchy, uh, it is by definition. Uh, we define God as all loving, all good. And uh, so you just define that God to be such. That, that you know, I'm not going to try to nail like this. And this is exactly how God is good. But God is trustworthy. God is... Well, but that's, you know, that's tricky because, you know, with how I would have grown up is basically more in, yeah, I won't name that tradition, but it, the tradition that shall be, not be named. <laughs> but when, for me growing up, it was easy to say God was good. But what got tricky was defining what good meant. So right. basically, if God says to bash the head of your enemy's kids on the, their heads on the rocks, right. we don't know how, but somehow that's good. Mm -hmm. So doing that is good. And so basically all we're doing is sort of rubber stamping. Whatever God does mm -hmm. is what we mean by good. Right. But now, I think uh, a huge percentage, a fairly large percentage of the American Christian population believe what this guy Jared just said, that if God said, bash people with rocks, stone them, then that is good by definition, if, if God truly said it. Also say the same teachers in my tradition would say, but that doesn't mean we can do those things too. Mm -hmm. At which point I would say, well, what's the point of calling it good? That's yeah. kind of a meaningless Can't do it. statement. Right. So I do think it's important to say, you know, not just come to, to, to the conclusion that God is good, but also what do we put in that box yeah. of what good is? And, and, and do we put... Yeah, what do we put in that box of what good is? And if your box is any different, Jared, than the nature of your deity, 
then you're saying there is a morality, a a standard of goodness outside your God that he is subject to. Into that box, like every Bible story. Well, that runs right. into trouble, right? Yeah, and that gets us into that second part of the question. You know, I don't, I don't think that we should, I don't think the Bible gives us the uh, permission to kill people and take their land, for example, even though you've got stories like that in the Bible. I don't think that we should be finding our enemies and slaying them, or we should be returning violence with more violence. But the reason I say that is because it's, it's not a verse approach, but it's a big picture story of the Bible approach. A big picture story of the Bible approach is how, why Pete Enns doesn't think um, you should use the Bible or use this idea of belief in God to kill people and take their land, which is commendable. I th- I'm glad Pete Enns believes that. But if you look at the big picture view of the Bible, is it really any better, Pete Enns? From Genesis to Revelation, does it really get that much better when you even have a Jesus character who, yes, says some great things and you give to the poor and so forth, but but spoke of this concept of eternal damnation more than any other character in the Bible? Is it still a good overview message? So, I mean, and that's how I read the Bible. I, I read it as sort of moving along trajectories and and critiquing even parts of the Bible based on that larger trajectory that larger story and i don't think you know jared if you agree with that too i don't think like we're alone in that this is this is not an uncommon thing and it's part of the struggle throughout christian history of this bible that says morally questionable things and and god can't possibly like be did you catch that so we're listening to two christians here who admit uh thank goodness that the bible says some morally objective objectionable uh, objectionable things listen again we're alone in that. This is this is not an uncommon thing, and it's part of the struggle throughout Christian history of this Bible that says morally questionable things, and and God can't possibly like be concerned with some of the things God seems to be concerned with in the Bible, and and part of I mean, and again for me this is just an important thing for me. How do I come to these conclusions? Part of it is my modern context with a universe that is infinite. I I, I harp on that a lot, but I mean it. It's like. What kind of a God, are we, is this a God really invested in tribal conflicts, for example? And is that where we get our notions of what God is like? Or is there something about the gospel and, as, as this questioner asked, the crucifixion story, there's something about that that is so counterintuitive that turns so much on its head. It is very attractive to me, and I would like... What about the crucifixion story is attractive to you, Pete Enns? Like, I guess he does not take the whole Jesus had to die for your sins uh, as a payment, as a ransom to Lucifer, this um, Satan. Um, my guess is he doesn't buy that. He, he maybe just views it as this great triumph of, uh, of overcoming evil by submitting to the authorities and just letting yourself die. I don't know. Either way, it's a, it's a story of human sacrifice, is it not? that and say, I will conclude from that, that God is good, or it's at least consistent with my notions that God is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and what did he just say there? It's so counterintuitive that turns so much on its head. It is very attractive to me. And I would look at that and say, I will conclude from that, that God is good. Because of the crucifixion and the resurrection, I guess, he concludes that God is good. Or it's at least consistent with my notions that God is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and it does get tricky for me when I think about, I would say in some... in some. Yeah, Adam S.C. asked, Doug, why do you want to be this type of Christian again? Um, if I were to become a Christian again, Pete Ans would be the type of Christian I probably would be. However, I'm going to ask questions and critique him that in a way that will show, like, this is insane. It's, it's, it's so obvious to me that these guys are taking their hands and squeezing as hard as they can and hanging on for dear life and i don't know why why are you guys hanging on for dear life to this idea of christianity senses i get this conclusion from the bible and then there are other senses in which i would not get that conclusion from the bible so i guess right. like, if you're reading the bible in our culture and i think that's an important qualifier in our mm-hmm. culture today there are places where you would say that what god is doing there doesn't seem to be good so we have a few choices we can make at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that's, it's important that we, I think we, we all make these, we do, we draw these conclusions. And a lot of times kind of going back to Richard Rohr and his episode on the podcast, we draw them usually based on 
this idea of experience and yeah. how okay, remember the question is why how do you know god is good um and now jared's going to give us i think his his main point here we i think we we all make these we do we draw these conclusions and a lot of times kind of going back to richard Rohr in his episode on the podcast we draw them usually based on this idea of experience and yeah. how we've experienced life and what we've been taught about what's good and bad and right mm -hmm. and wrong. And, uh, and so I think that's going to be, we have to talk about experience mm -hmm. in this. Right. And so it sounds like Jared's saying we know God is good based on our experience and based on our culture of what even good is. And that, that brings us then really to that second part of the question. How can you know, how can you be certain that God is loving? And I can't in, in, in that intellectual sense, I can't say, here's how I'm certain. And I don't think it makes a difference then whether you have a Bible that's inerrant and infallible because you've so he's Pete ends the man you can't know if God is good I think there's some verses in the New Testament where uh, I write these things that you may know you have eternal life now it's not talking about God being good but that you can have knowledge in the strong sense it really sounds like it's in the strong sense knowledge that that one a person is saved I have a Bible that's inerrant and infallible you've got some pretty serious moral questions to deal with and like Jared, you were saying before that, you know, God does X, Y, and Z, and that's good because God does it. Well, what about us then, right? It, it doesn't, you know, treating those as being th those kinds of stories in the Bible as giving definitive knowledge of what God is like, that doesn't solve the problem that actually raises it. This is why people stop being inerrantists or infallibilists of the Bible, and they look at it differently. They look at it from, you know, the point of view of an ancient world. How would they have talked about God at that time? Yeah, Pete isn't saying, look, you can't take the Bible, or this is why some people have left this whole idea of when the Old Testament said certain things, God commanded this. You just can't, you can't accept that because this whole idea of God being good, you now have to throw out the window because it goes so much against our, our experiences of what good is, and there's no way a God could do those things. So they, therefore, it can't be literal. It, can't, it says that God commanded these certain things, but it really doesn't mean it. That's not what God really did. And when I'm interacting with Christians like Pete Enns, I'll say, well, how, how do you know when it says that Jesus appeared to the 500 or Jesus appeared to the women at the tomb or shortly thereafter? Well, that's what it says. But how do you know that actually happened in the past? Like maybe it's a, it's a big, um, big parable like John Dominic Crossan says. In other words, it's, it's, you know, back to Roar, it's, it's their experience, too, that affected how they articulated what God is like. And we do the same thing, too. Well, how can you be sure that you're right? I'm not sure that I'm right. How can I possibly be sure that I'm right talking about the infinite creator in an infinite cosmos? I'm doing my best, and I have to trust, you know, to use the Christian language, which I embrace, the spirit of God working in us and in the world, and we're trying our best, and I will act as if God is loving. I will act as if God is loving. I don't know if God's loving, but I will act as if he is. Without being able to give a, you know, a formula for how I know that's absolutely mm -hmm. true. Well, and not to get too abstract. I'm about to get too abstract. <laughs> you always know someone's about to do it when they say not to do it. Uh, but this, goes, this is an ancient problem, and I, I, I think it's important that we say that. This is not, this is not a, a recent thing that we're, we're talking about here. And I, I go all the way back to you know, my training in philosophy. There's this thing called Euthyphro's Dilemma. Mm. And basically, Plato, not even talking about kind of the Christian, not even talking about the Christian God, but just the idea of God, this, this absolute God out there, and makes this case in this dialogue with a guy named Euthyphro, is, the, is it good, whatever we want to call good, is that good because God has called it good, or does God call it good because it's good in its essence? Mm -hmm. And the, the, it sounds abstract. That is abstract. But the reason it's important is because you really come down to two conclusions. Does God call anything that God wants to call it good and that's what makes it good. So if God says uh, murdering babies is good, it is good by definition because whatever God says it is, that's what it is. The other problem, if you don't say that, is then there's this thing outside of God called good that's even maybe better or bigger than God that sort of God has to obey, this universal sense of goodness. And so we, we, it's, it's called a dilemma because <laughs> it's a dilemma. Now, so far, he's not giving the standard conservative evangelical response to the euthyphro dilemma by saying well there's a third option it's god's nature that good is god's nature an outflowing of of his nature his nature is good um but no it's, it's still the same problem 
or mm. like a few thousand years later, we still haven't really solved this problem. Mm. Either we have an arbitrary God who can call things good however God wants to, or God seems to be serving this universal thing called goodness. And we don't really have a good answer to that. But I think for me, I moved, my tradition growing up would have been in that first camp. Whatever God says is good is good. If God says murdering kids is good, well, I guess it's good. Okay, so this is interesting. Jared used to come from that that way of thinking, uh, and so did I. And it sounds like he's moved on from that. Um, and I think it's because, because of things like worship and why I ask the questions I do. Uh, can you really worship a God that, would, that at some point in the past commanded these certain heinous things? Like even if he doesn't do it anymore, can you worship a God that did it in the past? And can you really call that good? And I think for guys like Jared, no, he just, I can't, I can't do it. To leading with experience, which is saying, we all experience this thing called goodness. And I think we're trying to figure what, what that is. Mm -hmm. And whatever God's up to, we're going to say it's part of that thing. Mm -hmm. And and I think that, frankly, that idea, though, of goodness changes over culture, which is what makes this whole thing kind of messy. Maybe not in its essence, but I think... Oh, see, now this is... There's going to be a lot of Christians uh, who hear this who are going to say, this, this Jared guy, he can't be a real Christian. He can't be a true Christian because he's admitting that this idea of goodness changes from culture to culture. Figure what, what that is. Mm -hmm. And whatever God's up to, we're going to say it's part of that thing. Mm -hmm. And and I think that, frankly, that idea, though, of goodness changes over culture, which is what makes this whole thing kind of messy. Maybe not in its essence, but I think in how it plays out mm -hmm. in culture and society, um, we would have called things like, uh, the women's women's place in the household and in culture and society, it would have been good and right mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago for a certain place because it was orderly and it was designed by the gods and this is how it was meant to be and it creates order and not chaos. And now we would say that's not good. Now, mm -hmm. now you know, this more egalitarian equality sense of society is good. So anyway, that's my abstract problem of this. Yeah, well, we question. always have to be careful of the problem that we as human beings, I think, can't escape and that is mixing together what God is and our own perceptions of that. And yes, we have to be careful. This is really good stuff. Pete didn't say we have to, Pete ends the saying, we have to be really careful of our perception of what good is and what actually is, is good. Um, the thing is, Pete ends, how in the world do you tell the difference when God says something is good versus just you feeling or experiencing through your culture that it's good? Maybe God really does want you to take a, a, a rock and smash it against a baby. Um, maybe he does for, for reasons, for morally sufficient reasons that you just haven't figured out. And I think until you figure out how to come up with a reliable way of figuring out when God's actually saying it and when it's just you thinking it, oh no, thinking, oh God, my God would never do such a thing you got to come up with some way to figure out the difference. Well, we Question. always have to be careful of the problem that we as human beings, I think, can't escape. And that is mixing together what God is and our own perceptions of that. Right. And I'm very comforted by the fact. Yeah, I wish there was a way to figure out, uh, Pete Enns, who your God really is versus just your perceptions of it or your interpretations from scriptures or from your experiences but the Bible itself, actually, you see that struggle within the Bible because you have that diversity in the Bible about, you know, how, what does it mean to be an enemy of God? And how do you treat enemies? And that the Old Testament and the New, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Old, they, we get different impressions about that. And I, I mean, I like I like that. So it sort of it it redu how do I put this? It doesn't reduce the Bible, but it it, it gives us a, a, a more workable impression of how the Bible works, not as you know an infallible text that's an errant will give us this information and we just ha accept it. But there is this inner dialogue and tension within the Bible. I think, you know, understanding what the, whether what it means for God to be loving is part of the task of theology and the part of the task of just living. It's not something that's going to come quickly from a book. And what I like about the, this question that's asked here, I mean, we're sounding critical of it, but it's, I think it's a very, very good question because it brings us into those things that Jared and I talk about a lot, like, okay, well, what is the Bible and, and what do you do with it with a question like this? What does it mean to say God is good? Well, I think that's a great segue into the second question. So ah, maybe yes. I'll read that. Okay. There's a good setup here. What is the Bible and what do you do with it? You know, it seems like only Christians struggle with that question. Maybe Jews, maybe I guess Muslims as well. <laughs> but it's a book written by men and has some inspirational parts, 
uh, great parts that that some uh, people like, and then it has a lot of uh, not so great parts that people struggle with. And for guys like Jared and Pete, they've moved on from struggling because they've given up the idea that every word it says is actually um, the word from a deity. So over the course of human history, so many people have put out there their approach to interpreting the Bible, living for God, following Jesus, kind of the religious way of life. So many teachings, so many books, so many people with opinions. How can we know which approach is right? Yeah, that's a common question. And the answer is... We can't. We can't. Oh, no. Right, next you guys, question. you're just confusing us. No, it's not. Because, you know, I get the question, right? We you notice they already are hearing... They're not hearing pushback from guys like me, from atheists, an atheist. Pete ends is responding, he's, he's already hearing the pushback from fellow Christians when he's admitting you can't know what the correct interpretation of the Bible really is. You just can't. There's so many different interpretations of so many different theological issues. Um, we might be stuck, he's saying. We get it. We, I wonder that too. Like, am I right? Am I more right than all those other people out there? And, but the thing is that we can't know it because... I mean, to state the obvious, we're dealing with God here, and we have to keep, I have to keep remembering that. We're we can't know it, because let's be honest, we're dealing with God. <laughs> Pete Enns is admitting here that not knowing is equivalent or similar to the whole idea of God, which gets us back to this idea of faith and believing something without actually knowing it not dealing with something that like some sort of an object that we can manipulate and turn around and analyze and assess okay now i've controlled it and i think part of the message of the bible is these sort of upheavals these tectonic shifts that happen in, in stories in the bible and again as christians very much so in the new testament th these tectonic shifts these big movements and big shifts these unexpected things that god is doing is just teaching us that god's always ahead of us not sort of behind us sort of in the pages of a book and so we, we can't know how do you know, Pete Enns, that this God is ahead of you? Assuming it exists, how do you know this God's always ahead of you? But we can move towards greater knowledge, I guess. I don't mind saying that. Like, greater knowledge of God, greater understanding, greater communion, greater experience with God. And the fact that there are, as the questioner says, absolutely right, there are so many people who have lived, who've approached interpreting the Bible and living for God and following Jesus in so many different ways, so many teachings, so many books. Yeah, so many different ways they've uh, approached the Bible. And my theory is that people approach the Bible based on their personality types. That you'll see those people who really are empathetic and compassionate and loving. You know what? They tend not to be presuppositional Calvinists, Reformed Calvinists. Calvinists. Um, they tend to be maybe more charismatic in a Pentecostal type church. And the people who just love, have the personality type who just love justice, and this has to be true, and, and, and um, I need the, to know this for certain. I need a f solid foundation. That's how you build a good house. You have a solid foundation, and then you build it up. Um, those are the type of people who, who will become, you know, more the, the staunch Baptists, um, the once saved, always saved types, so the King James only type, depending on how strong it is. And so isn't it amazing how our personality types seems to fit very nicely with the theology that uh, <laughs> that people tend to have. So many people with opinions, I'm not sure the point of that is to narrow it down to, well, here's the one that's more right than others. I mean, this, you know, Jared and I are both part of traditions that thought that way. You know, we're basically, we're right. We're, you, you can draw a line from Moses to Jesus to John Calvin, et cetera, and there you have the, the, the sort of the purity of the church, but everybody thinks that. And maybe this diversity in the history of Christian thinking, not just in the history of it, but just in the world today, people sitting in your church, if you go to church, you know, there's so much diversity in thinking, and what if that reflects something of the nature of God, too? It's not like, okay, guys, <clears throat> here's a Bible, here's a story, figure out the one way to understand this, and we'll see which one gets it right at the end. Maybe it's something about the nature of God and the character of God that leads human beings to come. Whoa, 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 whoa. Isn't, isn't, <sighs> Pete Enns, don't you believe that God is not an author of confusion, not the God of confusion? He's not the author of confusion, however the verse says. And he's basically saying, look, we have all these interpretations of different theological issues, that people come to the Bible with, with different conclusions, different slants on things. Well, maybe that says something about God, that he isn't maybe this one final answer, and that maybe he, 
has a whole bunch of different conflicting, confusing type um, properties. At this question of what it means to be Christian and all this from so many different angles. Yeah, I think of a, a few things. One is uh, Richard Rohr, who says... Who? Uh, Richard Rohr. Never, never heard of the guy. Yeah, well, yeah. he's, you know, I found him tucked away in a used bookstore somewhere <laughs> a long time ago. But he says, you know, rather than thinking about God as not knowable, what if we talked about God as limitlessly knowable? Mm-hmm. And, and so I think that's an important thing, too, because I think of it as when we're trying to figure out what's the right way of doing it. So I think of this absurd picture of, you know, we're really thirsty, we're in this big lake, and we're trying to figure out sort of uh, how to take a drink. And so we get the cup and we put some water in it. And we then we decide that that cup is like the only uh, the only thing that can quench our thirst. It's like, well, it is necessary. I needed to get a cup for myself. Uh, but then to draw the conclusion that only this is actually water is seems a little bit absurd. And so I like the idea of this. It's limitlessly knowable. There's lots of ways in which we can... App- Susan, great question. Um, why don't they just grow up and not need a father? Yeah, these guys have both rejected the inerrancy, this, the whole idea of certainty. Um, they're probably called non-Christians by a, a lot of their fellow Christians. Why do they still need Christianity? That's a great question, Susan. What is it? I, my guess is that it just it boils down to community and this good feeling of helping others and having a, some type of role model for it. I don't know. Which, how we know things about God. Um, and that also makes me think of a book by Brian McLaren that's called, you know, We Make the Road by Walking. So somehow I think we've, even these questions, these first few questions, which again are good questions, but they're both knowledge-based questions. And I think there's a privileging, there's an emphasis on knowing in our culture that I think the Bible doesn't share. And There's an emphasis on knowing in our culture that the Bible doesn't share. Wow. Wow. Our culture wants to know things, but maybe the Bible's not like that. Maybe it's not about knowing, not being sure of what we believe. Is that what he's saying? That I would say, frankly, I, I'm just getting tired of <laughs> because it's, it's like it's this disembodied idea that somehow what goes in our minds is the most important thing about our relationship to God. I want to propose, Jared, if you ever hear this, I want to propose something to you. I think you're tired of this idea of knowing because you're sick and tired of having to defend what you don't know and yet you actively believe. You actively believe certain things. You live your life in a certain way because you think you know something that Jesus existed and rose from the dead, maybe. I don't even know if you believe that. Do you believe, Jared, that Jesus rose from the dead? Huh. Yeah, I think you have been most of your life defending the indefensible, and that's why you're tired of it. God, or even to each other, that I think we need to move beyond and start talking about how do we make the road by walking? It's sort of, when do we stop lifting the weights and be, because we're trying to get to that perfect build and realize that this whole time we've been building muscle and we're getting stronger, and that maybe the process is the point. Mm-hmm. Well, how would you respond, Jared, to what you know we've both heard a lot of times is that, well, that's nice, but that sounds awfully subjective, and it's not going to help you be certain about, right? I mean, I know it's it's very circular, but it's, you know, mm-hmm. that's not helping me because I'm not really sure why being Christian makes any difference and whether I should just switch to something else. And it's it's a very subjective approach to the Christian faith and not objective. One. Okay, this is interesting. I want to hear the answer to this, like. Why not switch to something else? I mean, these two questions hang together, like you said. Once you take away a rule book Bible that tells you this is it, you mm-hmm. know, okay, even though the contradictions and tensions, this is it. This you just follow this, and that's all there is to it. That's that that suggests some objectivity to faith, and and this is very subjective. Right. Well, yeah, and I think you know the challenge is we are always and already both of those things. Hmm. Right. We're human beings in a world with objects and facts, and so we have to navigate that in some sense objectively it's when we think that that's all there is to it that uh, i think we get into trouble so we're all okay so jared's to his credit saying it's we don't reject um objective facts but there's more more to it than that i wonder what that more to it is is it that um intangible holy spirit type deal is it this thing that some people call faith subjective human beings like we we navigate life within our subjectivity all the time. And that's important. It guides us in a lot of ways, how I feel about things, my subjective experiences, how I think about um, 
you know, how I think about concepts that aren't out in the material world are all part of who we are. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not so much, it's that when we've exclusively talked so much about facts and objectivity, that it feels really scary now to even allow anything else as part of the mix. Well, why is it scary to allow anything else as part of the mix? Um, well, sometimes it's because our experiences, our feelings lead us astray. They deceive, we deceive ourselves. Um, they're not reliable. Human beings are terrible at reasoning. <laughs> um, okay, uh, they, now they go to commercial and let's see here. Let me fast forward it to... Actually, I'm going to fast forward quite a bit. Yeah, about there. Study, which is a hazard, right, mm -hmm. Jared, of going to seminary and things mm -hmm. like that. Not necessarily so, but it can be. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, the, but the irony is I think we have a lot to learn from our scientist friends because the way they came to more and more, uh, the way they came to their truths more and more certainly, if you can put it that way, is by not holding on to what they thought they knew. Right. It was through ignorance. It was through proving everyone else wrong over and over and over. Uh, Jared and I think Pete Enns are basically admitting that doubt, uh, meaning being open to belief revision, being open to changing your mind, doubting in that way, doubting in the sense of questioning the things you believe, not assuming that what you believe is true. I think they're saying that's virtuous. Let me rewind it here. <laughs> which is a hazard, right, mm -hmm. Jared, of going to seminary and things mm -hmm. like that. Not necessarily so, but it can be. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, the, but the irony is I think we have a lot to learn from our scientist friends because the way they came to more and more, uh, the way they came to their truths more and more certainly, if you can put it that way, is by not holding on to what they thought they knew. Right. It, yeah, provisional beliefs, provisional knowledge, I guess you would would say it. it was through ignorance it was through proving everyone else wrong over and over and over again mm -hmm. every theory they had about how the world works they were there is a process the scientific process mm -hmm. and they were committed to the process not to the conclusions mm -hmm. right. so they weren't oh we have what is that process they use it's called the scientific method but now now we're we're settled and we feel secure and we're in control of this no because then that got overturned and then that got overturned and mm -hmm. that's how they came to what we now know as sort of scientific knowledge right and that was applied to the Bible, you know, that kind of thinking and what that did. And, and, and sometimes, it, you know, it, big mistakes have been made in the history of biblical. That was applied to the Bible? The scientific method was applied to the Bible? I don't follow you here, Pete. Scholarship, but it, it looked at it critically. And so what that has done for a lot of Christians over the past couple hundred years, it either makes them reject sort of science and that kind of mm -hmm. thinking, or... It makes them um, ignore what's going on, or for some people, it actually drives them to a different kind of faith where, my goodness, clearly, you know, we don't drive this certainty from this text. You know, the, the modern world we live in is ironically driving us into a more immediate experience of God rather than that always being filtered through our heads. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a dangerous place to be. It really is because our heads do all sorts of things. You know, if you oh, that's a great uh, admission there. Our heads do all sorts of things. This is why I say to Christians that when you th think back about the time when you felt the closest to God, when you felt the closest to Jesus, however you want to put it, when you think back of that time, it's usually probably a time when you were going through um, some type of trial, tribulation, something bad happened in your life. Uh, and then you think you had this experience of God, that he did something for you or spoke to you or you even maybe even saw him. Pete Enns is saying, you know, that's, it's probably false. That probably didn't happen because our mind can really play tricks on us. Modern world we live in is ironically driving us into a more immediate experience of God rather than that always being filtered through our heads. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a dangerous place to be. It really is because our heads do all sorts of things. You know, what people say, I mean, this was either... Uh, Homer Simpson or Rousseau, I, depending on what website you go to. But actually, it might have been Mark Twain, but, um, you know, f forgive the sexist language, but God created man in his own image. And like gentlemen, we've been returning the favor ever since, right? right? We're always creating God in our image. And we do do that, right? But we just got to be aware of the fact that we're sort of drawing God into our own way of thinking. And maybe God's just way, way, way beyond that. And we're all trying to access God in, in, in ways that 
don't do violence to our basic humanity and experience, mm -hmm. right? And I don't, I don't think God, I might believe that God doesn't expect anything else of us. Right. Well, yeah, he's just admitting that, um, Peanuts is admitting that people create a God in their own image. And, and Pete Enns, I think, would admit that this God that he has in his image is a God that would never do the things that, he, that happened in the Old Testament. Pete Enns rejects those things that happened in the Old Testament. But Pete, aren't you creating this idea of a God based on your own cultural experiences? You're creating this God in your own image, saying, oh, I would never do such a thing, so therefore my God would never do such a thing. Like, how dare you? Like... God is way out there. It's he's you can't you can't know what this God exactly is, right? Didn't you admit that before as well? I think Pete for Pete Ans is he has to believe this, otherwise he has nothing left to worship, and he needs something to worship. It reminds me of what John Calvin said that our hearts are idol factories mm -hmm. that we're constantly creating idols. That's what I kind of think of when we create God in our image. It's right. an idol. It's, right. it's a picture right. that is tainted by my own subjectivity, mm -hmm. and to deny that doesn't actually do us any favors. It mm -hmm. just makes it more dangerous. Right. So you, you can create God in your own image as long as you're, you realize you're doing that very subjectively, and it's always open to correction. It's when we think that our subjective ideations about God are actually objective, like absolutely right. true and certain. Well, that's. Yeah, and this is the doubt is the virtue thing again. So Pete Enns is saying, yeah, you know, I can create God in my own image, um, but then that's fine as long as you realize you could be wrong. When people start killing each other because, you know, they think about God. Well, because it's interesting the sleight of hand that happens because God moves from being certain and objective and absolute to me being certain and absolute. Right. And that's, the, that's where it gets dangerous. And that's tempting for everybody, I think. You know, <laughs> you don't have to, like, be in, like, in a weird church or denomination or pastor. That's all of us are subject to that. And... And in a way, confessing our sub subjectivity is a real confession of faith at that point, mm -hmm. that I'm actually laying down my ego and I don't claim to know this stuff. Yeah, it's a posture. Well, how can you be certain? I just told you you can't be certain, right? Yeah. Well, are you certain about that? <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, don't even try that one with. Oh, they're dissing presuppositional Calvinists right now. I mean, I've had a dollar for every time somebody said I that. know. All right. Well, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to this question because yes. I think this, t this is a great roundup question. Our last question okay. for this is, what's your perspective on Christianity in your daily life? I was always taught a true Christian would spend hours a day in prayer, bring every conversation back to God. So what is more necessary from, from our perspective? Oh, yeah, from our perspective, which is not necessarily what the questioner is yeah, it assuming says the, Yeah, saying. the question says a progressive perspective, yeah. but I'm not sure. I know what, yeah, I know what they mean. Though. Right. You know, I, I like Brian McLaren's terminology where he doesn't use progressive or traditional. I, I'm trying to think what language he uses. Instead of, instead of progressive, he says creative. Instead of like traditional, he says, I think, preservationist. Mm -hmm. And he means those as neutral terms. Not to get off topic here, but right. every, every articulation of Christianity, that you need both. You're, you are trying to preserve something because this is an ancient tradition, mm -hmm. but you also realize the need to be creative in the world that you live in. Yeah, I think we right. use the term, I like the term because it rhymes, but preservation and innovation. Okay. So you're always yeah. preserving something, you're always innovating. and that's As long as they're not pitted against each other as absolute oh, right. enemies or something, because they're not, right. you know, you have to have both. It's a both hand, yeah. But anyway, okay. So what's your perspective on Christianity in your daily life? Okay, I'm working that out. You know, because I don't know if I was ever really taught to think about that very deliberately. I was just given a bunch of shoulds, some of which are listed here, spend hours a day in, in prayer. Well, it depends on what you mean by prayer. Does it mean sitting down with your eyes closed and your hands folded? It doesn't mean just, you know, going through your day and maybe stopping quietly every once in a while and not reacting to something that's happening. You know, is that, is that, I, I think it is. Or bringing every conversation back to God. I definitely understand what that means. Boy, do I get that. But... What if nothing ever has to be brought back to God because God is everywhere and all around us? Like, and it's my job to, you know, to, to sort of baptize everything that happens. You know, the Yankees beat Tampa Bay today, 12 to 1. It was an amazing game. I, I had a great time watching it. I don't really know if I'm going to bring that conversation back to God, other than God willed it or some stupid thing like that. You know, not to make light of it, but you know, I'm not sure if the, you know, it's a sign of Christian maturity that we, that we conceive of prayer that way, mm -hmm. you know, bringing it back to God as if God was missing somehow. Right. Maybe. Rather than that, maybe having this more expansive view of God. I'm... I, I'm kind of confused here. It kind of sounds like Pete Enns is just saying, I just basically live my life. You know, you don't have to bring God into every conversation. Now, I appreciate what he's saying here, but why be a Christian? Like, why do you even need it at all? It's not necessary to bring that, bring it back. Right. And, and if you look at the Bible, I think there's something to be said for God being localized in some sense. And then as we move mm -hmm. through the Bible, God becomes, as, as Rohr says, it's this universal Christ, that God is in all. And, uh, and there's something important to the practicality then of how we practice our faith. Because for me, getting realizing that maybe uh, practicing Christianity 
in my daily life didn't always have to deal with my brain because mm-hmm. that's right. how it was for me it was you read you pray you study you ponder you reflect it's all very heady stuff and then you apply right if you get around to it if- you can really tell that jared uh got really burned out with i guess trying to trying to defend what he believes or just trying to be the right christian he just I get the impression from Jared, he just said, this is enough. Enough is enough. I'm tired of this. I'm just going to rest in God. That's a popular phrase in Christian circles. Yeah, and it's like applying became so cheap. It became like a cheap knockoff at the end of all this thinking. Very mechanical and task-oriented and things like that. Yeah, so I mean, for me, it's become way more um, participatory Mm -hmm. and way more... Uh, engaging in relationships. So being able to, which took a long time for me not to feel guilty about that. Like, oh, so being a good friend is how I can be a Christian in my daily life. Mm -hmm. There's no... Being a good friend is how I can be a Christian in my daily life. Do you need to be a Christian in order to be a good friend, though, Jared? And I think Jared would say, of course not. Then why do you need Christianity at all? How is it that Christianity actually helps you to be a better friend in your daily life? This is what I would like to know added remainder there's not being a good friend and then trying to get them to convert to jesus and then having them talk about god and then Mm -hmm. reading a bible story with them that wasn't part of it especially when all that is overlaid with a subculture kind of like what all that even means because the assumption there is that a a particular way of thinking of the christian faith and again i'm not i'm not trying to take pot shots here but just for you know ease of communication here you know a standard sort of evangelical conservative way of thinking about this stuff like you talk to people about jesus they accept jesus they go to heaven you know when they die they won't go to hell that's that's already a construction of christianity that i'm going to say most of the history of the church would know what to do with right mm-hmm. maybe maybe in the modern reactions to the enlightenment like we were talking about before you start thinking differently about this stuff but i mean i think the gospel's always meant much more than those things so already there you know we're just imposing something onto it yeah. yeah. And, and I, you know, for me, I would say I, I actually attend a Mennonite church now, and that's been extremely helpful because um, it's very, very community oriented. You so, drive buggies? Oh, he attends a Mennonite church now. I can tell you that Mennonites who are raised Mennonites, like myself, when outsiders who are not Mennonites come in, it's like, Jared, if you ever hear this, I, it depends where you live, though. Um, because Mennonites are a close knit bunch. And if they see an outsider like you, who is not a Mennonite come in, they, they won't really treat you <laughs> the same as their fellow Mennonites. Well, actually maybe they'll treat you better because you're not a Mennonite and Mennonites can be really hard on each other, but it's such, it's such a tribe. Um, but it, you can tell again, Jared just really, he wants to do stuff. He's so sick and tired of knowing stuff or trying to know stuff, that he now he just wants to help the community and so forth, which is great. He wants community, which is great. But why do you need Christianity for that? And it's interesting that he ended up going to a Mennonite church to find that community. Nope, we don't do drive buggies. Oh, that's Amish. That's, that's old school. Oh, that's other kinds we of We haven't Am- driven Mennonite. buggies for at least 20 years. <laughs> no. um, so, you know, things like uh, justice and reconciliation, peacemaking. Like, seeing that was such a foreign thing to me. I, I mean, I was... Frankly, I started attending a Mennonite church because I was just so curious about these people who practice their faith through things like peace and justice. Like, oh, but where is, where, I kept wanting to say, kind of quote, where is Jesus in this? Where is Jesus? (laughs) And it's like, no, Jesus is in the peacemaking and in the justice. It is in the, it is in the 95 year old woman with the head covering at the drone strike protest. Like, Mm -hmm. That is where Jesus is. Oh, mm-hmm. wait. Like, it just short-circuited mm-hmm. my brain mm-hmm. until over time I started thinking, oh, so practicing our faith. Like, maybe this is what the Bible was pointing to when it talks about how we walk in love and how we walk in truth. So, Yeah, see, I don't know this Jared guy at all, but if I was going to bet what type of personality type he has, he's, he's a highly compassionate young man. Comprehensive is our gospel. What, what, how mm-hmm. much of life does it encompass? Right. And that is, I mean, I, I mean, as I'm saying that, I do remember how I might have reacted to that in my mid twenties, for example. I would have said, "Yeah, you got bad theology." But again, as I get older, it's different, and it's not like deciding to become progressive. It's just life experiences leading in certain ways. And you know what? You know, Jared has just said a lot about what it means to him, and I would have different things to say, which is sort of the point in all right. that. Uh, Dan the Meek, are these gentlemen married to believers? I'm quite. Sure they are. Living believers, siblings, or parents, I'm quite sure they are. Are all their friends part of the Christian community? Yes, I'm sure they are. And that's probably, uh, Dan the Meek, why they're still Christian, why they've basically rejected this whole idea of, of epistemology, of, of knowing with a high degree of confidence that what the Bible says is true, uh, rejecting most of the Bible, and yet still being Christians. 
is that there's no sort of there's no necessary way of this sort of a progressive or innovative uh, again, well, can, innovative can be insulting. To maybe people, even you know, saying two two questions. It's for me. It was moving from how should we to how might we. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not the shaming right wrong dualistic. How should we? As though there's a right way and a wrong way necessarily. Yeah. It's more how might we? What are the possibilities here? Yeah, you can tell that Jared and probably Pete are both gentlemen who uh, their personality type is not so much for um, shaming, judging. Uh, they're more like, l let's live and let live and, and try to help each other. More like, you know, the typical hippie, although they're probably not hippies. Um, and this is why I think they hold the theology they hold. That I haven't yet considered about what it means to live. Recognizing your limitations as a person. And, okay. Yeah. yeah. How might we? Right. Um, which is freeing up. It's saying, yeah, inviting you to practice Christianity in ways that are different from mine mm -hmm. that I can actually learn from and celebrate mm -hmm. kind of that diversity of practice. And did you say there were two things? Or was it just well, just the two. The okay, two would be two moving yeah, from, right, right, moving there, yeah, yeah, those two is, right. is moving from a how should we to how might we language. Yeah. I don't know. And f I mean, for me, I mean, I guess I, I resonate with that, but I just, I'm thinking of recent experiences like um, wanting to live the day well. Right. And what does that mean for me? And I've really had to think about that as an expression of Christian faith. And for example, you know, I, for a long time, I would in the morning get a cup of coffee and read the Bible for half an hour. Now, I actually happen to be doing that right now, but I don't really feel an obligation to it. I just feel like it. <laughs> you know, I know that's you're not disciplined. Actually, you do that every morning too. So, um, and I get up pretty early, but sometimes like, you know, I, I've learned sometimes to just sit there on the couch when the sun hasn't come up yet and just be and, and not have any obligations. Like, okay, I'm going to have words come out of my mouth now or use an app that has a liturgy where I don't have to make words up because that's the, see, for me, the big problem is like, I got to get away from my words and my head. That's all I do. And I, I love them so much. I love my Yeah. It's, it's almost sounding like they're using Christianity as a form of, um, meditation now. Oh, yeah, I love my words. I'm such an amazing person. I use the best words anyway. So, okay. Um, Better words than anybody else. So, you know, I got, I got Jared. Jared, get up off the floor. Yeah, you can tell these are Christians who uh, definitely did not vote for Donald Trump. Floor. Oh, Wasn't man. that funny? Oh, um, but you know what I mean? It's just for, it's different for everybody. Like for me, I, I've moved into a more liturgical environment over the past 10 years because I have had to make changes that I needed to make. Right. And that may, for some people, be progressive. And for other people, it might be well, welcome to normal Christianity. I mean, it's, it's not progressive for some. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think this is relative and that's okay. And I'm not judging myself by how, by some standard of normalcy or something, because again, I have to believe that God is big and not within my control. And did you hear that? This is really amazing to me. Listen to this. By how by some standard of normalcy or something, because again, I have to believe that I have to believe that God is big and not within my control. And God is big, bigger than me. I can't control him. Why do you have to believe in any of that to begin with, Pete ends? What does it give you? Why do you need it? It's, it's like I'm imagining um, the need just dripping off like water off a leaf right now. Just drip, drip, drip. I need, I need, I need God to be this way. I need God, I need God to be real. I need God to be bigger than me. What does it give you, Pete ends? I can't manipulate God by doing the right things and, you know, by saying the right words and having the right routines because that gets very mechanical too. And, and, and trying to listen to, again, that I, I hope you guys will hear this the right way, but listening to that inner voice, which I'd like to think is the presence of God sort of speaking to me. And sometimes it's... He would like to think that's the inner voice is God. Just, you got to just relax a lot. Mm. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to perform all Well, you use... The <laughs> Yeah, I would like to think my inner voice is God, but he's, he, you can tell that the way he's saying it is, he's saying it, it but it probably isn't. This whole idea of, of Christian saying, I, my inner voice, that, that's God speaking to me. I'm getting a sense of the Holy Spirit leading and so forth. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. Phrase, how might I live well today? And that's a suspiciously wisdom sounding mm. question, okay. which I think is, I think it's a good, I think it's a good question, mm -hmm. you know, how might I live well today? But I think it thrusts us back into that earlier conversation of how might I live is a very subjective question. Yeah. The answer to that question may be very different for me than it is for you. Mm -hmm. And of all people, you know, Friedrich Nietzsche, 
makes this point where he says, it's interesting to me that we talk about how everybody's body is built differently. And so we need different nutrition. We mm-hmm. need to eat, you know, some people need more protein. Some people need more breads. And we're learning, I think, through all these fad diets and other things that he was kind of right. Like, oh, it's, what works for you doesn't work for me when mm-hmm. it comes to food. And what, and he kind of makes the point, well, spiritually, he would say, uh, when it comes to morally, maybe that's true morally too. Mm-hmm. Maybe how you answer how might you live well today is different than how I live well today. Mm-hmm. And of course, we pretty much excommunicated Nietzsche for saying that kind of thing. Yeah. But I think coming full circle, that subjectivity is so important that do we believe maybe that that small, still voice that God is speaking to you as an individual or as a community is saying something different than us? And can we trust that? Right. And, and Yeah, that's the, the real question, Jared. Can you trust that small, quiet voice inside you telling you to do this versus that? Um, and then can you trust that at any time that that voice, is, that inner voice is actually coming from a deity that you guys have admitted has at times been created in man's own image. We handle a God who can do that. Right. You know? Again, it's not just, I, 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 forgive me for harping on the same thing, but this is why a Bible that is theologically diverse is a gift to the church. But how do you know if you're, okay, I know that, that's the question that comes up, I get it, but maybe that's the wrong question to be asking. You know, uh, mm-hmm. are there parameters within which Christianity operates? Yeah. Do I care to define them? Not really, not now. I mean, maybe one right. day, I just don't want to do that, but the thing... <laughs> are there parameters in which the Christian church operates? Do I care to define it? No, not really. I I wonder why P- Pete Enns doesn't want to define what Christianity really is. Because then he'll have to... If he tries to define it, he has to justify it. He has to defend it. And I think these both these guys are just tired of doing that. Is that I know that I see people in the Bible reacting differently and thinking differently and articulating God differently depending on circumstances, not mm-hmm. haphazard, but it's more like it's growth, it's change. And that's not just from Old Testament to New Testament. It's within the old and it's within the new. There's diversity in, in, in every part of, of the, the Christian uh, scriptures. And I, I just come to say thank you. Thank you for not giving us a, you know, a, a book that even tries to cohere in that way, that logical sort of analytical way. Because Thank you. He's saying thank you to God for not, being, not giving us a book that's logical or coherent. Did I hear that right? <laughs> Sorry, I got to rewind that. Christian uh, scriptures. And I, I just come to say thank you. Thank you for not giving us a, you know, a, a book that even tries to cohere in that way, that logical sort of analytical way, because it doesn't. And that's actually, that's a good thing. It doesn't. The Bible does not cohere in a logical, analytical way. Pete ends, oh boy, that's a nice quote to clip there. Thing. That's not a bad thing. At least it is for me. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we have, I mean, we've thoroughly answered. And that's how they end it. Wow. Wow. It's like he's happy that the Bible is this nonsensical, incoherent, non-analytical, wishy-washy, subject to multiple interpretations and multiple theologies where nobody's quite, everybody thinks they're right, but could be wrong, and he's happy about that. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, um, I guess, Eastern. It's like, instead of, um, it's a, instead of either or, it's like and, 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 uh, what I'm hearing from Pete Enns. But it gets back to, what exactly is Christianity to Pete ends? Pete, do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Yes or no? Does it matter to you if he really did? Yes or no? Do you believe that there's a heaven and hell? Yes or no? Does it matter to you? Yes or no? Do you, what do you really need from this belief? What is it giving you that you couldn't get from something else? Why are you still a Christian? And is it the fact that you're grateful that the Bible is not coherent and not analytical? Is, is the reason why you're thankful for that is, is it because you can't defend it otherwise? You cannot defend it in an analytical way or a coherent way? 
I have a feeling, Pete Enns, if you could defend it in an analytical or coherent way, you wouldn't have said what you just said. And I think guys like you and Jared have just thrown up their hands and said, I give up. I just, I can't make sense of this book. Um, but I know God's real. Why? Because I have to. But why do you have to is the question. Elias fake name says, I still prefer Paul Enns versus uh, to Pete Enns. Yeah, I think I do too. But yeah, this was very interesting. And the thing is, I know quite a few people like Pete Enns and Jared. And I just, it has to be about community. I can't think of... Meaning, purpose, hope, community. Because they're so close to just kicking it all out the door. I really don't know why they need any of it other than that, I guess. Oh, um... Although Susan makes a good point. Or maybe Blood Wolf. <laughs> Maybe this is all they know how to do. No, but Pete Enns makes a good, he makes good coin from, I think, being a professor and writing books. Well, yeah, writing books is probably because of Christianity. But yeah, what would they do if they didn't, um, if they left Christianity? Well, they could probably sell more books. Yes, how probable is that? That's exactly what Pete Enns is saying. The Bible is rock solid the way marshmallows are rocks and solid. Brandon, great point. You can find community at the skate park. Yeah, maybe I'll have to change my mind about if I become a Christian again. That's the Pete Enns type Christianity. It just seems so wishy-washy. Someone mentioned earlier about uh, John Dominic Crossan. Maybe if I become a Christian again, I'll become his type of Christian. Or um, Dennis McDonald. But they don't, there's almost no one on the planet besides those two guys who consider themselves Christian. I mean, who view them as Christian? Because I think, I think Dennis R. McDonald views himself as a atheist Christian. He said he doesn't believe in any god, but um, adapts the, um, some of the tenets of Christianity. Well, doorknob head, I I'm I'm on my way to becoming a Christian again because in the mail. I got my prayer napkin, holy oil. Whoever sent these to me, thank you so much for putting my name and email and address on their um, mailing list. I'm looking forward to so many gifts to come, but they're not going to get a penny from me. Yeah, it's true. Pete Enns doesn't give me this. Good point, Mind Onion. They're superstitious in a different type of way. Poof. Thanks for hanging out with me, guys. Have a great, great night. <laughs>